The Lord be with you. And also with you. Thank you very much, and welcome to Calvin Church this evening. We're all here because God has brought us here, brought us here to worship Him, and brought us here to acknowledge a bit of our creatureliness, and even more to acknowledge um, God's creatorness. So as we come to worship God this evening, will you pray with me, please? O Lord, our God, long-suffering and full of compassion, be present with us as we enter this season in which we recall our Savior's sufferings and celebrate his triumph. Give us your Holy Spirit so that as we acknowledge our sins and implore your forgiveness, we may also have the strength to deny ourselves and be upheld in times of temptation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. People of God, would you please stand and receive a welcome, a greeting from our God. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, from Jesus Christ, his Son, and from the Holy Spirit, that same Spirit that makes us one, one with God and one as the people of God. Amen.
Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing you have made and forgive all who turn away from sin and toward you. Create in us clean hearts. Make us sorry for our sins so that we want to confess our brokenness to you and receive the perfect forgiveness you offer through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah. 
Let us pray. Through God's word, O Holy Spirit, bring us closer to our Savior. And in response, triune God, prompt our hearts to offer you sincere thanks for our salvation. In the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We hear together from Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. Shout out. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion to the house of Jacob, their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today begins the church's journey through the season of Lent. Isaiah 58 is a good text for us to hear as we begin Lent. Part of the reason it's good for us to hear is because many Christians take up a discipline during the season of Lent, like fasting from something or adding some spiritual practice to their life. Isaiah 58 gives us a good reminder. Make sure you're not doing these spiritual practices in a hypocritical way. 
Make sure you're living a well-rounded Christian life, one that includes Lenten disciplines and includes a broader seeking after justice in the kingdom of God, a life that includes both prayer and action, both words and deeds. Don't just talk about your faith, says Isaiah 58. Live it out. At the beginning of Lent and any time, that's a good reminder for us to hear. But there's a deeper reason that it's good for us to hear Isaiah 58 on Ash Wednesday. It sounds like the Israelites whom Isaiah was addressing may have used religion and practices like fasting to almost hold God at arm's length. They may have used religion to say, I will take care of this myself. I will perform the rituals and there's no need for God to be involved in my heart or in my finances, in my workplace, in my family. I will perform the rituals, and other than that, I will be in control of my life. On Ash Wednesday, we begin Lent by remembering our mortality. From dust you have come, and to dust you shall return. That's the reason that ashes are our symbol today. They're a symbol of death. Every Christian who receives this symbol, no matter how old or young or sick or healthy they may be, hears the message that they will not live forever. They will die someday. There is something terrifying about this message, of course. We don't want to hear that we will die. We'd rather keep imagining that we will live forever and that we are in control of our lives. But our mortality reminds us that we are not in control. We will die someday, and we don't know when that day will come. We will not live forever, so we are not in control. But for the people of God, this message leads directly to the message that God is in control. God does live forever. And for Christians, this also leads directly to the message that in Jesus, death itself leads to eternal life. At the end of Lent, we will celebrate the fact that Jesus died and rose again. And because of his death and resurrection, our own death leads to resurrection too. Our own actual physical death at the end leads to a resurrection to eternal life. And our own death to sin every day leads to the new life that Jesus has given us to live. This kind of death and resurrection might lead us to fasting. Because fasting is a way of giving up control. We give up small pleasures for a time in order to focus on God. And Isaiah 58 reminds us that this kind of death and resurrection also leads to seeking justice. My mortality lets me know that this is not all about me, which drives me to seek the good of others. If I'm going to die someday, maybe the most important thing is not my own illusion of control or my own comfort. Maybe the most important thing is the justice and peace of the kingdom of God. Isaiah tells us that this justice and peace of the kingdom of God is a beautiful thing indeed. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden 
like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. Because of Jesus Christ, these ashes are not something to be afraid of. And they are not, for us, a symbol of gloom or despair. Because of Jesus Christ, when we're faced with our own death, we rely on his life and the life he has in mind for the whole world. And we see that it is better by far. I like the way poet Jan Richardson puts it. All those days you felt like dust, like dirt, as if all you had to do was turn your face toward the wind and be scattered to the four corners or swept away by the smallest breath as insubstantial. Did you not know what the Holy One can do with dust? She continues, so let us be marked not for sorrow, and let us be marked not for shame. Let us be marked not for false humility or for thinking we are less than we are, but for claiming what God can do within the dust, within the dirt, within the stuff of which the world is made and the stars that blaze in our bones and the galaxies that spiral inside the smudge we bear. I'm so glad that our children's choirs lead us in worship on this day, mostly because they're very good at it, but also because it reminds us that this message of mortality and reliance on Jesus is for everyone. We all of us can depend on Jesus. The first time I led an Ash Wednesday service, not at Calvin Church, but at another church, a family came forward to receive ashes. The young daughter became suddenly shy when she was in front of me. So I offered for her to receive the ashes on her hand instead of on her forehead. She liked that idea. Then I became suddenly shy when it was time to speak those words to this innocent young girl. From dust you have come, and to dust you shall return. I didn't want to think about her death or about her sinfulness. She seemed too young and unspoiled. I didn't want to think about Lent or about her dying to her old self. Instead, I put the ashes on her hand and I said, Jesus loves you. Now, of course, that was not a bad thing to say to the young girl. But I look back on that, and I wish I had sent the same phrase to her as to everyone else. She could have asked her parents, what did that mean when Pastor Rebecca said, from dust you have come, and to dust you shall return? Her parents could have answered her, it means that Jesus loves you. It means that no matter what happens to you, no, what, no matter what happens to us, no matter what happens at all, Jesus will forgive you and Jesus will love you. No matter what happens, you will need Jesus and he will be there for you. That Ash Wednesday service, after all, was not the first time that this little girl came to the front of the church and had a hand placed on her forehead. 
she was baptized there. Before she was old enough to be shy about it, the church heard that she was dead to sin and alive in Jesus Christ. And because of that, there is nothing to fear in her mortality. There's nothing to fear in her sin. She is a sinner saved by the living God. She will surely encounter sin and death in her life, and she will even more surely encounter the forgiveness and loving power of God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Lord, we confess our desire to control ourselves and our world. And we come before our mortality and realize that you alone are in control. You alone live forever. And so we thank you for your great promise in Jesus Christ that we die and live with him. Lord, prepare us to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The earliest Christians observed Easter with great devotion. It became a custom to prepare for Easter with a season of penitence and fasting. Penitence means being sorry for things you've done that were wrong. Fasting means giving up good things for a short season in order to focus more on God. It was also a time when people were preparing for holy baptism. This t- and this time of preparation was called Lent. Lent is what we are beginning tonight. I invite you, therefore, to the observance of a holy Lent by taking the time to say you are sorry to God for things that you have done that are wrong, by spending time in prayer and in reading the Bible. We will begin Lent tonight by repenting and telling God we are sorry. And then we will also receive a sign of ashes to remind us we will all die one day and that our lives are a gift from God. Let us now confess our sin before the Lord. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned against you in what we have thought, in what we have said, and in what we have done. And it is our own fault. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved those near to us. As you have forgiven us, we hold grudges against other people. We have not served other people the way Jesus served us. We ignore those in need, those around the world who are hungry, and those who suffer.
We are angry when we don't get our way. We are not happy with what we have, and we want what other people have. We are greedy. We don't pray as we should. We are lazy. Worshiping you is not as important to us as other things are. We have not told other people about you. Restore us, good Lord, and do not be angry with us. Accomplish in us your good works, that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. Friends, God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. May God the Father, who does not despise the broken spirit, give us contrite hearts. May Christ, who bore our sins in his body on the tree, heal us by his wounds. And may the Holy Spirit, who leads us into all truth, speak words of pardon and peace.
Let us pray. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be to us a sign of our mortality and penitence, that we may remember that it is only by your gracious gift that we are given everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I invite you to come forward to receive the sign of ashes. You may come forward up the center aisle and return to your seats by the side aisles.
Let us pray. Jesus Christ, we want always to remember that you love us, died for us, and rose from the dead for us. In the next weeks, help us to remember and help us to trust in you more and more. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit. God sends us from this place with a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. <laughs>